podcast called uh, Dove Jelly Slim Podcast. He probably doesn't remember this at all. Get yeah, record together. It's easy. This is kind of real. Like, holy shit. And so it's really cool to get to be a part of that. Hey, you know how this goes. Hey, when you... You now tune into the biggest ever. When I hit you to take part, when I hit to take over. <laughs> I don't remember that. That's crazy. What's up, everyone? We're back with episode 157 of the Dub Jelson Podcast. Today, for a special guest, ESPN College Basketball Analyst, Steffi Sorensen. Steffi, how are you? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk to you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, so, so I know before we hopped on here, you're talking about you're getting things ready for your house, you're selling it. But uh, what I mean, what, what's been keeping you busy during the offseason? Um, obviously, when college basketball ends, I don't know if you do any work with like WNBA and, and stuff like that, but um, what, what keeps you busy during the quote unquote off season, I guess? Well, for the first few years, once I got into broadcasting, um, I actually did college football mm-hmm. and college basketball. So I was kind of on the road for seven to eight months out of the year. And it was fun, but it was not sustainable. I have a lot of respect for people that kind of do that year round because come April, when I'm done with basketball, I'm white. Like, mm-hmm. you know, you spend four months on the road and it's, it's a, yeah, it's exhausting. Um, so I take a, you know, I just take a little bit of a break, relax. Um, but what keeps me busy right now is I actually co-own a restaurant with my sister, a uh, full service restaurant seats about 300 people. So a couple of days out of the week, I'm helping them run that. And uh, I've got a couple business ideas myself. I, I love sports. I love broadcasting. Um, but my father, he's an entrepreneur, my sister now entrepreneur. So, you know, got some ideas flown of perhaps my own business. Um, so kind of putting some things together and seeing what, uh, what will happen. Not to mention, uh, my sister has four children and they live across the street. So they're always here. I had to get one of them out of here so that we could do this podcast. So <laughs> well, I appreciate that. How, how was running that, that restaurant during COVID? Did you have it during COVID? Yeah, so they, um, I say they, I mean, it's it's really, I just invested in it, um, but it's my brother-in-law, he's a chef, and my sister, uh, she obviously runs all the operational side, and, uh, you know, they were pretty fortunate in that uh, COVID hit, and it was, you know, we, they were still building it out, and so that, that was fine, and then um, people at that point during COVID wanted to get out. Um, we're down here in Florida and people wanted to get out. Um, I, I, despite how you fall on the restrictions and all of that, say what you want, but from a business standpoint, um, they didn't have any really any, anything blocking them from opening up at capacity Mm -hmm. and, and people came (laughs) and it it, it was (laughs) chaos and it was chaos for like the first month of launching because it was just, everyone had been cooped up inside and in St. John's County, it's it's a very fast growing county and, and it just, they were just dying to go somewhere else. Mm. And so uh, they, they've been really successful with it, but it, it was really, well, very fortunate that, cause I know so many people lost their business. Mm. You know what I mean? Like that is, I just feel like they were really fortunate and really blessed for the fact that like they didn't get hit with you can't open or, you know, none of those restrictions and, and people could work there and, and um, good things happen, not bad things. So uh, it's a good question, but they, they made it through and, you know, they're thriving right now. So I'm happy for them. Yeah. I'm happy to hear that. I mean, some people talk like, Oh, down in Florida, COVID didn't even exist. And some, <laughs> they, you guys just don't care down there for some stuff, but. Uh, it is. <laughs> I mean, traveling during everything that happened, um, you know, I, I was living in Atlanta before I lived the, mm-hmm. moved down here. And I will say living in Atlanta, now that I live down here, it would be like so different <laughs> coming down here. And I'm like, yeah. wow, y'all don't do anything. You know, like some people took precautions. Like I have people in my family that um, have some, you know, autoimmune issues and stuff like that. So like, you know, we were always careful, but it was definitely like different. Mm-hmm. Just different. So <laughs> yeah, that's probably the, that's the best way to put it, you know. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, getting away from that, how much do you keep an eye on the college basketball landscape um, throughout the postseason? Uh, because I mean, you look around now. I don't know how many girls are in the 
transfer portal and, and everything's moving around. And I mean, it's, it's, it's mayhem in the off season for college basketball, college sports in general. Um, so how much do you keep an eye on that? Well, I'd be curious your thoughts um, as well. Um, I do follow it, uh, especially just, you know, when I was at the final four and I was with a lot of different coaches, um, you know, they were just on their phones, on their phones. And I was like, damn, like, what is going on? Like, you know, we're at the final four and it's yeah. like, uh, the, you know, that's the prime time for the portal. Like all these players are leaving. And so like with the, with the portal, like a lot of these coaches got to get in there and like, they're trying to grab kids like immediately. So it's like, it was like a full-time gig. And I was talking to a couple staffs and I'm like, I feel like you guys now need a portal position coach, essentially someone who monitors the portal year round. And like, that's what they recruit. And mm -hmm. a lot of people were like, it, that's coming. I think there, it's already there football wise. Uh, I think there's already like a portal position on the, on football staffs or being created. Cause that's, you imagine the, the turnover on a roster like that uh, on a women's or a men's team, you know, it's 12 to 15 players. So I, I watch it, you know, it, it amazes me um, now with name and likeness of, this has always been a slippery slope for me. I, I think that players should be able to, to make money off their name. I'm a free market person. If someone wants to buy their Jersey or wants to pay them for this, then let them do it. I have no problem with that. Once you, once you open that gate though, then it's going to come down to, well, who's going to pay me more players are leaving because they want more money. Mm -hmm. And I think everyone's like, yo, <laughs> <laughs> We wanted this, but we didn't, we didn't want that. You know yeah. what I mean? So it's like, um, not only just watching the portal, watching transfers, watching coaching changes, but also name and likeness deals. And then why are players leaving because of certain name and likeness deal, yeah. deals that they can get elsewhere? Um, so I, yeah, I definitely, you know, I, I follow it. it. I think it's really entertaining, honestly. Thank oh, yeah. God I'm not a coach <laughs> because as, as a fan, as a spectator, you're watching it and just like, wow, didn't see that one coming. Where are they going? You know, you see half a team go into a portal and you're like, you know, what's going to happen? I think it's just the fluctuation of rosters year to year. It's just wild. Mm -hmm. You know, it, if you can keep your roster the same, more power to you because I just don't see that happening anymore. Yeah, it's getting to like free agency type level. Of, yeah. uh, it's It's so weird to see, but I mean – I'm in the same boat as you. I want to see people get paid, but like from my perspective, I'm a Purdue guy. So we were recruiting Nigel Pack from Kansas State um, on the men's side. And he was down to like Purdue, Ohio State, and Miami. And he took, he picked Miami because they were giving him 800 grand. Yeah. And then a story comes out of Isaiah Wong, who's on that Elite Eight team. He's like, I want a bigger payday for NIL or whatever. And so he said he's going to put his name in the portal. And then he like retracted it probably because someone was said, Hey, cut that out or we're going to pay you, you know? So, yeah. I mean, but yeah, it is to see all the, all the different things. Cause there's a ton of people that, that leave and you're like, where did that come from? Yeah. You no. Know? And then like on the men's side, LSU lost their whole roster. I'm pretty sure after that coaching change. So, I mean, uh, it's craziness, absolute mayhem right now. So for you as a, as a fan, as a spectator, someone who covers, you know, sports, what, does it take away from the collegiate aspect? Does it feel professional now to you? Or do you still feel like when you're watching it, you're still watching college sports? And it's when, when I'm sitting down watching games, it doesn't really affect anything because the fans are always going to be there. You're always going to have packed out gyms, um, especially in the big conferences like Big Ten, SEC, um, ACC, whatever. But I mean, when you get to this this part where no games are going on or whatever, it feels like a professional level um, game. It doesn't feel like college sports anymore. But do you see coaches wanting to maybe step aside sooner than later? Like I know we've seen coaches starting to retire now, and um, you know maybe coaches leaving for the pros. You know. Mm -hmm men's college coaches, women's college coaches, because of the new, I've just seen so many different coaches talking about it. Here's my problem. A lot of people complain and a lot of people, a lot of coaches talk about it in a negative way, but they also benefit when they grab a great player out of the portal. So it's kind of mm -hmm. like, uh, how do we fix it? Or how do we make it um, sustainable long-term? I, I just think at some point you have to close the portal. 
you know, I think that you, just got, you can have, you know, windows. I'm not a fan of someone leaving in the middle of the year, going in the portal and then leaving. I, that happened on the women's side a few times. And I just, I don't agree with that. Uh, I think you should start where you finish and you just finish mm-hmm. the season and go, you know, but I don't know with NCAA, what will happen? <laughs> no, I don't know. I, don't, I think everyone is just like, what, what are we doing? Yeah. You know? It, and like you said, there is no real like solution, maybe closing the portal, having windows, whatever, but like how much is that really going to stop things? Yeah. It's just. Well, I mean, if, 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 you're a player for Kentucky and you see a player for Louisville that can make 500 grand. What stops you from, well, I can make 500 grand instead of it being about a program being better, or you want to play for this coach. It's a dollar sign now. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's definitely interesting. Um, The landscape has completely changed. Recruiting has changed just having been with coaches at the final four and, you know, some of the, you know, the main players are all, they're going to get their players because they're Mokies and Genos and Dons, but like people coming through, coming up through the ranks, you know, and, and competing th- with that. Like, I think that's kind of why I just was like, don't probably not going to coach, <laughs> you know, like I've thought about it just because mm. I'm around the game and I love the game. And you're like, how much of it is X and O's and how much is it, is it of Facebook posts, Instagram posts, doing TikToks and yeah. speaking the language of the modern day recruit? And that's probably just not my cup of tea. So <laughs> I'll settle for, you know, commentating, which has been fun for me. So, mm-hmm. and then, I mean, you have those smaller schools like, I don't know, like Murray State or whatever, like in the OVC or the, I don't know, the, the Big West or whatever, whatever conference you want to say. I mean, they're screwed. If they have a, a straight baller, they they want to leave. They're going to go to a Duke, a Kentucky, Miami, whatever, whoever can pay them those money. Yeah. The biggest, sure. their biggest nemesis, some of these bigger schools, is getting to the NCAA tournament mm. and playing a power five team really well. There goes your best player. Because now the whole world, the whole country just saw them play. And some coach is going to poach them away from your team. You know, and that's, you know, I've, I've seen that now throughout Power Fives is like they, they just pick up a, a mid-major player and it's like, oh, they had 26 points in NCAA tournament. It's like, you know, I think of uh, Tennessee, Kelly Harper found Alexis Dye. She played at Troy and she was a great contributor for them. And she got one year and, you know, she was a baller at Troy and played the NCAA tournament. Kelly Harper was watching them and was like, <laughs> I get that kid. You know, so it's, it's interesting. It's, it's, it's fun, but it's, it's definitely a, an interesting time in sports. Now for you, as someone who transferred uh, technically twice, right? It wasn't the portal back then, but you transferred twice. I was a portal. I mean, yeah. I mean, what, how do you, th- do you think it would have been different back then for you guys? Man, I was, <laughs> I talked to so many younger people and students, athletes, and I'm like, I didn't want to sit out. Yeah. So like I went to JUCO because I didn't want to sit out. And I think, um, you know, kids were starting to transfer at that time and it wasn't like unpopular, but it was rare. Yeah. And then kids would just have to sit out a year and, and train and just practice. And like the thought of that, just like, I just couldn't, I didn't want to do it. So my brother was at the JUCO that I transferred to that was in uh, Gainesville. Um, my first school FGCU there they're a mid-major powerhouse now, but it was our first time, first year transitioning into D1. And, uh, you know, it was uh, probably not a, probably not the best environment. It was, how do I properly say this? It was, I'm, I was 18, you know, it was a lot. It was a lot. Um, and I just didn't feel like it was maybe the right fit long-term. And so I think that that is common and that happens. And, and I think my jumping around to three different schools was a little bit unorthodox, given the fact that now players can just boop, go here and go there. You know, that would have been ideal. Yeah. But I will tell you this, the best year, I would say, of college, of the most fun and just like meeting people was my year in JUCO. And I think that like, that's why I have a lot of respect for people that come find, find their way to a uh, an AC school or a big 12 school from, from a JUCO because 
I spent a year in JUCO and you get all kinds of walks of life. Like I had so many different kinds of teammates. I had foreigners, I had people from Brooklyn, Harlem, you know, like just mm -hmm. all kinds of people. And um, it was just, it was so much fun. It was like laid back. And I think I kind of needed that um, after a really like stressful year at FGCU um, being under a microscope there. So um, I think, yeah, it'd probably been different. Probably would have gone to two schools, <laughs> um, <laughs> but I will, I, I love the fact that I went, I basically played D2, D1 at a power five and Juco. So I got like every view of the game. And I think that that, that has kind of translated into my broadcasting career of just seeing the game through a bunch of different lenses, you know, but just life. Like, I don't, reg like, I have no regrets about the way that it all panned out. It looks kind of, are we allowed to cuss on the podcast or? Is, yeah. yeah. It looks fucked up when you like, think about it. I went to three mm -hmm. schools and I'm telling kids to stay. And it's like, we well, went to three schools and I'm like, I had never left, you know, I, I stayed at a school, yeah. Juco, I didn't want to sit out, you know, and then I walked on at Florida. Um, and that's a whole another story in itself, but I don't know if you want me to get into that, but. Yeah, we can talk about it. You want to talk about it? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I don't want to bore you, but when I tell, when I tell, when I speak to kids now, college kids, and you know practices or shoot around I tell them that I walked on at Florida and I, I started every game most of their jaws drop because my jaw dropped when I read that <laughs> when I was yeah I was like yeah. geez well I think a lot of people don't I think conceptualizing that as a young person now you're like walk-ons are practice players you don't start you don't play and you know I was in a situation where I was recruited by a couple schools couple of BCS schools that offered scholarships. My dream was to play at Florida, but they couldn't offer me a scholarship. So I was a preferred walk-on. So I was on the team, but like, I just didn't get a scholarship. Hmm. And um, so I had to turn, I turned down a scholarship to play at USF um, to walk on at Florida. Okay. Which was hard because I took pride in, you know, basically like paying, I wanted to pay for my own school and that's a big plus. And that's something else that gets lost in the mix is like graduating without debt. Holy shit. Yeah. <laughs> you graduate without debt. You know, that was a big deal to me. So I didn't want any help paying for my school. So I did have like some scholarships uh, in Florida for academics, but the very first day of practice, I remember my coach didn't call my name out for like postcards. She's right. She yells out everybody's name and, and she didn't yell at my name. And I was like, okay, like, I guess like you don't either care or like you forgot I'm here. And so I just kind of jogged down towards the guards. And it's another example that when I'm talking to young people, I'm like, a lot of people would use that as a reason to leave or to quit or to like, screw this. Like I'm not wanted here or like hang your head. And, and sometimes adversity is a really good thing for you and it can bring out the best. And I think that's what happened to me where I had a coach who, who kind of got me and she pulled me aside and she's like, now I know that that probably bothered you. And, but you need to, you need to show us and show her my head coach. I'm good friends with my head coach. So it's not, <laughs> I'm not blasting her, but I, I obviously will never forget that feeling being at my dream school. And my coach doesn't call my name out on the first day of practice. I can't even believe I'm in orange and blue. And here I am. And I like, I don't hear my name. And I'm just like, I will, I will show you. I will show you. And I think that when you take that mentality versus someone who was a McDonald's or American force or recruit, and maybe their expect, expect, expectation is like, oh, like I'm supposed to do this mm. versus like, I'm going to show you why, like you are going to play me. And you're going to have no choice. And that is just like, that has always been my mentality. Like, you know, when I would go, when I was in junior college, I would go to the Florida games and I was like, dude, if I just got, like an opportunity, like, I know I could play. I know I could play for Florida. Mm. And, you know, I was, I did some uh, forum the other day and someone was like, where did that confidence come from? And I can't tell you where it came from, but I just knew. And so, you know, within that first game, by the way, our first game was at FGCU and we lost. <laughs> oh, and then, you know, I just, from then on out, it was, I think that my coach felt like I just, she, she had to put me in. And that is something that, you know, the mentality of a student athlete today is like, that's 
always what I try to tell players is like, you got to, you got to like make your coach feel like you've got to be out there. And, um, you know, the, the rest is history. I mean, that was a defining point in my life. And I'm forever grateful for that because I still carry that chip with me no matter what, you know, Mm -hmm. no doubt. And I don't know how, how much your teammates knew of you or, or knew, knew of your abilities, but like, when did, when did that point, when was that point where they were like, oh shit, she can play. Like you weren't just a, you weren't like a walk on, like, yeah. Like we know, we know what the walk-ons look like now, but you weren't, you weren't, you, you shouldn't have been a walk-on put it that way. Um, and, and now like everyone's doing these really cool, like celebrations for when players get scholarships mm. missed out on that, you know, so I called <laughs> in my coach's office and I thought I was in trouble and she was like, you got a scholarship. Um, so I think, you know, I joined, so I was there for summer and I was just kind of training and I noticed that like, you know, I, I definitely trained really hard. I always wanted to be, you know, put my best foot forward. And I think like some of my teammates would joke with me like, hey, this ain't, this ain't Juco anymore. You know, like our training and like everything was very intense. But so it was my first year at FGCU, like nothing was as hard as that. So um, I think right around the time, like fall came around of that, my first year, my junior year, and we started like scrimmaging. Mm-hmm. And I think that my teammates, maybe reluctantly, because it's not easy to walk on and people to give you respect. I mean, you you have to really earn it. And I think, if, you know, I worked really hard in workouts, but you got to put the ball in the hole. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> you got to make shots. And so I think, you know, just proving over time, like practicing and like before I knew it, like plays were being run for me okay, late in the game, plays are being run for me to, to hit the game winning shot or to be in the position to hit shots. So I think that that was kind of, you know, it definitely took time, but I, I don't know. It's a good question. Actually, no one's ever asked me that. Um, I'd have to ask a couple of my teammates, like, did y'all think I could play or did you just think I sucked? Like, you know, <laughs> but I mean, ultimately you just, the proof's in the pudding. You gotta, you gotta perform. When's the first time you, you talked to your to that head coach and was like hey you remember when you did this um I haven't specifically brought up that moment with her it I will I haven't seen her in a while um you know she didn't have the best ending at Florida and it was kind of not a great not a great fallout but she's she's doing well at Clemson and we keep in touch but I will bring it up (laughs) on my series because I've had to talk about it because um, I've just been sharing my story uh, recently with more more coaches and more players. I think because we can get in awe of like the Sue Birds, the Dino Tarasis, Tamika Catchings. Like, of course, like players going to want to hear what they have to say. But like those players are like the less than one percent. Yeah, I'm the common person. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the person that like I'm, you know, in the middle, but like I want to be the best you know, I'm going to work really hard. And I think like my story might resonate with more people than someone of that caliber, because like they are just head and shoulders, you know what I mean? Like they're just LeBron's tiger, you name it, like the the greats. And those are few and far in between. So um, I think like, I just maybe, maybe my story resonates more with people because it's, you can relate to it. Like, I'm sure there's been players that like have been pissed off because like their coach tells them that they're only going to play 10 minutes. That's what they told me. We're not going to need much from you. You can play 10 minutes, hit a couple threes. If we, if you get in there and do that. And I was like, hell no. So we ha- I haven't brought it up to her. I think I just always kind of kept it internal, but sure. She could use some rem- reminding. <laughs> <laughs> now, were you under recruited coming out of, high school because when you're miss basketball in florida um, and that that's a rich state for talent for any sport um and then you go to a a d2 school even though i know there were they're transitioning to d1 but were you were you under recruited um i was definitely in the mix at um a couple power fives um honestly was recruited by ivy league schools and i just didn't think i was smart enough to go (laughs) (laughs) you know like uh like a princeton and then uh, Cornell, like they were kind of heavy on the recruiting, but, um, I I wouldn't say I was under recruited. I just think like maybe people didn't think I could play D one, like at a power five level. Mm. Um, I really wanted to go to Florida. Florida never called Carolyn Peck 
I'll never forget. She's my colleague now. Um, so I just, I think that people maybe didn't think that I would be quick enough, fast enough, athletic enough, or be able to compete with some of the athletes and power fives. And so, um, you know, I was a dummy. I took one visit. I went down to FGCU. I actually like FGCU is a great school. Carl Smusco is a fantastic coach. You know, he would probably be in a power five. Um, it would just have to be the right fit. He's turned out a million different programs, but he's turned that place into a great plate, like great program. And, um, so I just took one visit. I think I just wanted to get it out of the way and I committed. So I don't, I didn't go anywhere else. I didn't take any other visits. I just did one. You don't seem like a person that likes all that extra stuff. You want to get right to the point. Yeah. And I think like I was getting overwhelmed with like, I mean, there was a lot of mid majors and, you know, uh, recruiting and calling at that point, it was like leaving messages on my parents uh, <laughs> house, house phone, mm -hmm. uh, get letters in the mail. And I think like, it just was a little bit overwhelming and God, I can only imagine in today's world, you know, where there's like every facet of your life is like, you're being recruited on like your phone and your Instagram and Twitter and everything. Like I do not envy any of that. Um, but yeah, I, I'm definitely like a known non, like I, I didn't, you know, Carl, was like it's going to be really hard I didn't ask a lot of questions I probably would have asked now like mm. how long do you run practice or you know like basic stuff um but I will say that like four or five of my teammates there are all now like head coaches so we had a really good team we lost on a national championship we mm. lost one game so we were a really good team and I think like uh I don't you know maybe it seemed weird like miss basketball going to like a d2 school but like their program is actually really good our team probably would have blown out a bunch of d1 teams we were just transitioning not to be arrogant but they just were i mean we were we were good um so maybe i was under recruited i don't know i, I mean i would assume that you were but but i wasn't there you know i think that people just doubted what i could do yeah fair enough but i mean that point kids are getting recruited on their phones and I mean they have specific departments now and uh, for basketball or football or whatever they're sending you like graphics to post when you come and visit and all that stuff <laughs> that's how they do it I was like how do they all these players have jerseys you yeah. know when the players post like being recruited by this jersey so that's what they're getting sent yeah they just it's like a it's like they I mean they do it for everything like if you commit if you're if you're, well, if you're going on a visit, I think they just like take pictures or whatever. They give yeah. you a random jersey and you throw it on, whatever. But um, yeah, there's a lot of people when they commit, they have like a personalized thing that they get that, or um, they go through like Tipton Edits or or one of those Instagram accounts or whatever. But yeah, it's it's getting weird. Could you imagine? No. <laughs> you know, and and with name and likeness and parents and agents and. PR, like, you know, players having to assemble a team now at 17, 18 year old, 17 or 18 years old. I think of like uh, Paige Becker's mm -hmm. side, you know, first athlete to sign with Gatorade and call it, you know, like never been done before. And, you know, she probably makes like a million bucks. And like, <laughs> that's a women's basketball player. Did we imagine that a women's college basketball player could, could make you know, major money with endorsements and everything. I mean, it certainly puts a lot of like responsibility and like uh, pressure. Mm -hmm. See that pressure. On no doubt. Different kind of pressure than before. Well, I think this was right before everything went down with NIL. Like it became legal, but I saw a thing. It was like the top 10 most marketable college athletes at the time. And I want to say like seven or eight out of the 10 were college women's college basketball players. They, they know what they're doing. This was insane. To me. They, <laughs> they know how to run their Instagram accounts. Like Haley Van Lith from Louisville, mm -hmm. you know, she's probably like top five. Um, there's a girl for UNC, Deja Kelly. She was like four. Zaya Cook from South Carolina was like seven. I think uh, Paolo Bancaro was in the top five of Duke. Um, last year but yeah I mean a lot of women's college basketball players like they're they know how to market and I think there's like this balance of like 
lifestyle and basketball and then being a baller on the court you know um that like that, that is that's the triple threat and you'll get a kick out of this because um with Deja I talked to Courtney Banghart the UNC coach uh when they were down in the sweet 16 and she's saying that coming over from Princeton you know and recruiting a completely different type of athlete now at UNC and she was saying with Deja like Deja wanted to know this isn't to put her on blast it's just this is most athletes she wanted to know how could you make me better as a player as a person and as a brand and that's what we're seeing now that mm-hmm. that three level you know what can you how can you make me better in these three things versus i didn't what is my brand you know you're not thinking about that until shit i don't know you're 30 right <laughs> but now there's people are 17 thinking about branding so it's it's like i said like it's just makes for an interesting and uh f- fun thing to cover <clears throat> yeah i mean if they're going to have the opportunity to make money though, good on them for wanting to and, and, and trying different things and, and making that money. Like you'll never hear me complain about someone getting paid. Cause like, I mean, it's America. You can do whatever the hell you want. And if they're going to, if someone's going to give you a million dollars, who are you to turn it down? You know? Yeah. I, I think they'll learn about taxes much sooner. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> at college. <laughs> when you see a certain percentage come out of that, you know, I think that's always been the plus and something like, on smaller, smaller scale, like talking to people, um, a couple of people around Kentucky, I remember like before name and likeness came into fruition, it was um, teaching a, like on the men's side, a lot of the one and dones, like instead of taking plain classes, taking classes about like how to manage money, portfolio, like taxes, like learning like real life skills, because you're not really going to be in school for long. Mm-hmm. And so like, I think that that's something that moving forward that I'm, I'm assuming universities are taking care of where like athletes know like how to balance their budget. Like what is their budget? You know, stuff that will be helpful when you're, instead of just getting a million bucks, which we see how many athletes where they eventually go bankrupt from yeah. poor management of money. Those things weren't, weren't taught. And I think that they should sound like an old grandma right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. No, nah, you're saying what's real honestly and now i mean not a lot of people are saying that right now they're just like oh yeah these these dudes getting paid whatever i mean i had carlos williams who was a running back for florida state on this was a while back and and he was like who's gonna teach them about about money and and how much they have to pay in taxes and and all this different stuff and and he was like someone needs to start like a company that that focuses on that because some of these kids like like you mentioned they're gonna run through that money because they're 18 to 22 year olds yeah. Buying stupid stuff, doing whatever. I mean, yeah. if, if someone gave me a million dollars right now, I don't know what the hell I'd do with it. Yeah. I do some stupid stuff, though. I know that. Yeah. Uh, you know, think about a CPA, you know, getting a company that just goes around. And, and when you're like 17 to 19 years old and you get handed that kind of money, people will take advantage of you. And instead of seeing at the professional level, where you know players sign contracts and they they're not necessarily sure what's in it. They've got an an agent who's got an attorney, and they're like, "Oh, you're all good. You sign." Then you sign over like uh, powers of attorney without even knowing, and now you have no control over your money. You know that's what I don't want to see happen. And granted, it's a little bit outside of my expertise, but I I always think about like things from a practical and pragmatic stance. Like we're going to start putting money in all these players' hands. Great. Are we going to teach them like what to do with it so that like they can build money off of their money, you know, like, um, my, my financial advisor is a former NFL player and he manages a lot of football players money. And he's like, that's my number one thing is like athletes get taken advantage of a lot. They think this is good because someone tells them it's good and then they lose money. And so, and he also did tell me his character, his character was, uh, the rock that show uh-huh. him. I'm like, okay, whatever. Um, <laughs> Good dude, but sorry, off track, but you basically like just, you know, life skills, life, like you, you can sense from the 30 minutes we've been talking that like, there's been a lot of people that have said no, or have said like, you're not good enough along my way. So like, I probably carry myself in a way that's like a chip on my shoulder, like underdog forever. Yeah. Right. And I think that like, it's okay to, to carry that mentality. You don't always have to be like, um like have it figured out like you just bet on like believe in yourself believe in yourself no no matter what and I think that like that can go forever like that mentality but 
it seems like with social media, we have to pretend like we're all like, we have to pretend we're something we're not. And like, I don't like, I don't like that. I don't buy into that. Yeah, there is a, there is a lot of fake stuff going on. Pretend. You, people got to pretend, you know? Yeah. Cause you don't want to be like, oh, I'm, I'm going through this. I'm having financial troubles and relationship issues, whatever. You don't want to, you don't want to do that. You want to be like the cool person that has nothing wrong and everything's going, going well, but I mean, that's that's not real life obviously yeah well i think the thing that an instance that was kind of like eye-opening to me was uh i was with a player from one of the schools that wanted to take a picture and we did and the the player was like um my audience prefers like when we're when i'm more casual and i was like the hell does that mean exactly <laughs> <laughs> and i was like so do i stand differently <laughs> but staged images versus like casual. And it's just like, you know, I don't know, like student athletes just, it's there's just such a big microscope on them, you know? And it's like, you're aware of your audience. Who is your audience? It's little things like that, that you go, man, we're in a different world. But I mean, it's everybody, I guess, right? It's everybody. Yeah, something that you wouldn't even have thought about. That, I mean, that doesn't even, that doesn't even register in someone like my mind to, yeah, they like me more casual. I don't know. People are stupid, but. <laughs> um, <laughs> you said it. I don't know. Well you, well, you were thinking it probably. No, I just, it was like concerning. Like if I have a child and like they come, come up through all this stuff, I'm just like, man, is that like, are they going to be like even younger 14 yeah. like i'm sure that's even the case now like 14 and like they're aware of their audience and like who mm -hmm. likes their stuff it's just it's nuts but like hey gotta make the best of it so well yeah there's there's people like um oh, what's his name like tristan jad the kid with the curly hair he's kind of he looks kind of redhead but i don't know if he is but he, i mean he's been a he's had a, like a million followers for years and years I think he's a basketball player. I think he played at Liberty. Oh, okay. But I mean, he's been in the microscope for since he was probably 14. Yeah. That's just the way life is going and society is going, which is it's it's crazy to think about. But yeah. All right. Well, I'm a, I'm gonna wrap this thing up. Um, I know you gotta go. Thank you so much for coming on. It it was super okay. fun. Um, it was an honor to talk to you. Thanks for having me. It was good to talk with you too. Anytime. Yes, ma'am. Have a good one. Thank you.